Well, once again, good morning. I'm so glad you guys are here. You know, it's great when I can look out and see your faces. I mean, it, it, helps, it helps me. Now, for you folks watching online, I can't really see you. And, and I know that you're seeing me, and it's right after this thing flashed across the screen that said Stranger Things. And that's not really me. Well, it is, but it's about the sermon series that we've been in. And, and I heard a story. I heard a story that I wanted to share with you because it, I heard about this boy and uh, he had, all his life growing up, heard stories about his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, who had walked across the lake that was there at their end, edge of their farm to the town that was across the lake. They had walked across the lake. And it was kind of a legend that, you know, this happened. You know, each, each of them, when they turned 18, when they decided they were a man, they walked across the lake into town which, you know, taken around the lake took a long time to get there. So. so this boy, one summer, decided, well, I'm turning 18. I'm going to do just like my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather before them. I'm going to walk across this lake into town. So he went down to the edge of the dock, and he took a step, and he sank right in. And so he was a little upset and confused. And so crying, he went to his grandma and said, you know, I tried to do like my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather and, and walk across the lake into town, and I couldn't do it. And the grandma said, well, you're not as smart as they are either. And this kind of added a little bit of an insult into the injury that was already there. And he was like, well, why do you say that? And she goes, well, it's because your father, your grandfather, and your great-grandfather were all born in January when that lake is frozen and they walk across. Today, we're going to look at the miracle of Jesus actually walking on water. I mean, liquid water is what he walked on. So let me remind you that the author of this book, John, was the youngest of the 12 disciples. And he self-identifies in the biography of Jesus as, uh, he doesn't say uh, John, but he describes, he, he lists himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, that's, that's some confidence right there. This guy knew he was a child of God and a person of worth. So John wrote this story of the life of Jesus with an evangelistic purpose. So let me remind you that, um, again, that, he, he, he stated what well, he stated in John 20, 30 through 31, which we've been using as our anchor text, where it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So kind of like Michelangelo, Chip, Michael. Michelangelo chipping away the slab of marble to release the beauty within. John, one of the first followers of Jesus, carefully selected seven of 40 of Jesus' miracles to reveal the beauty of Jesus to his readers that would draw us into belief in Jesus. So let's go to our fifth stranger thing, the miracle of Jesus. And let me set the scene. Jesus has just fed a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, so likely more around 1,500. And he fed them with a boy's sack lunch. And the crowd, hungry for a political savior to release them from the clutches of the evil Roman Empire, want to crown Jesus king. And I mean, who could blame them? Anybody that could feed thousands on a Happy Meal had the miraculous power to overthrow Rome. And Jesus would hear nothing of this because he, he was not a political savior. I mean, those kind of guys are a dime a dozen. He was a spiritual savior of the world. So Jesus leaves the wanted crowd and he heads up into the hills all alone. And this is where we pick up the story in John 6, 
16 through 21. Look with me at the screen or in your message notes. It says, that evening, Jesus' disciples went down to the shore to wait for him. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they, they got in the boat and headed across the lake toward Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them and the sea grew very rough. And they had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid, I am here. And they were eager to let him in the boat, and immediately they arrived at their destination. So this is a pretty amazing day for the first followers of Jesus. Thousands have been miraculously fed, and the crowd wants Jesus to be king, to be the rescuer of Israel, but Jesus is nowhere to be found. And John does not tell us why, but the disciples get in the boat, and they're going to head back to their headquarters in Capernaum. Now, everything in Israel is kind of exaggerated. What they call a sea would be a lake. What they call a mountain would be, we would call a big hill. And what they call a river, we'd call a creek. Or if maybe you're from the south like him, you'd call it a crick. The Sea of Galilee is a 12 by 7 mile body of water. And Jesus and his disciples are about 7 to 8 miles from Capernaum. Um, in some remote place, where the, um, rowing their boat back home without Jesus. When it, about halfway home, a storm arose, and I've heard from people that uh, on the Sea of Galilee, storms do come up over the mountains and change the water very quickly. So filled with fear because of the storm already, the disciples see a figure walking on the water, and their anxiety goes through the roof. But what's interesting to note is John's telling of the story is that Jesus speaks first before they do. And he initiates the conversation and he calls out to them, don't be afraid, I'm here. Now John writing that they were eager to let him in the boat is an understatement. I mean, of all the stranger things Jesus did, uh, of changing water into wine, uh, of feeding thousands of people uh, with five barley loaves and two fish, I mean, that gave them confidence in the middle of a fearful storm. These disciples, then and us disciples now, had, we can find our confidence in Jesus, can't we? So here's the question we want to consider this morning. How does belief in Jesus overcome my fear? What is it about having Jesus in the boat with us? that has the possibility of giving us the confidence in spite of a fearful circumstance. I mean, we think the story screams of two attributes of Jesus that we, when we make um, reliable help to find peace in the midst of fear. And first, number one, Jesus is victor over evil. So look with me at the story in detail in John 6, 18 through 19a. Soon a gale swept down upon them, and the sea grew very rough. They had rowed three or four miles when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. You know, one of the struggles of, of reading the Bible, which is a book written by 40 authors over 1,500 years with, uh, in two primary languages, is that we don't always understand the context. Imagine if you know, uh, Doc Brown showed up in his DeLorean, uh, back to the future style, and took us back 150 years, and we tried to explain a smartphone to our, to our great-great-grandmother. I mean, she would have no real context of a smartphone because, uh, well, there wasn't even a phone back then. Alexander Graham Bell hadn't invented the telephone until 1876, so the meaning of things changed over time. And in Jesus' day, it was commonly understood by people that the sea was a place where evil lived. And there's a story of Jesus casting out demons into pigs who jumped into the sea. And to the hearers of these stories, that made perfect sense because the pigs were, were trying to outswim the team. They were, they were returning home to the place of evil. So when Jesus comes walking to the disciples on the water... 
He's making a powerful statement. He was saying that he had authority over evil. And again, the miracle points to Easter and the resurrection from the dead when Jesus victoriously defeats death, hell, and the grave. And Jesus is saying in this Stranger Things miracle that he indeed is God. Not a part of God or, or some God, but God in the flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John began his biography with that bold declaration. See, the Old Testament declares God's power over evil, kind of matter-of-factly, the Bible. Well, the Bible is not Star Wars. Sorry, Star Wars fans. The, ba the battle of, between good and evil doesn't, doesn't come equal in the Bible. It's not Luke Skywalker against Darth Vader. I mean, that makes for a good movie, but it's awful theology. And worse yet, it's, awful, uh, it's an awful way to live. The Bible boldly declares that God is the victor over all evil. Look with me at Psalm 93, verses 3 through 4. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have, the floods have lifted the pounding waves, but mightier than the violent raging seas, mightier than the breaking on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. The Lord is mightier than these. The seas with all its demons cannot defeat the grandeur and greatness of our God. Jesus, walking to the disciples on the water, makes a definitive declaration. And consider this too. If you're a student of the Bible, you, you know from the four characters in the, in the Bible we walk, that walk through the water, you, 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 you're, you know, Moses led the uh, Egyptians, or the, excuse me, lead the Israelites uh, through the Red Sea to escape the Egyptians. And, and Joshua led, um, he was Moses', Moses protege, he led the Jews through the River Jordan into the Promised Land. And then Elijah and his uh, men, led his mentee, Elisha, too, they walked through the River Jordan. But only Jesus in the Bible walked on the water. He has power and dominion over evil. Uh, Jessica Legrone, who is an author and she's an Asbury uh, professor, she points this out in her new book. Uh, she says, in the, in the very beginning of Genesis shows the spirit of God hovering over the waters, and there's darkness and void and emptiness. But God's spirit is over them and prevails by creating order, light, and fullness. By walking on the water, Jesus was treading on evil, crushing it under his feet. So where is evil kicking you these days? Where does it feel like Satan and his gang of demons is winning the day? Because Jesus wants to know, wants you to know that he has defeated evil. It might feel like the pain of Good Friday, but Easter Sunday is coming. Maybe not in this life, but maybe in the, but for sure in the life to come. Your desperation, your depression, your anxiety, your bankruptcy, your disease, your heartache, your sorrow, your addictions are going to be defeated by Jesus. The second attribute of Jesus, the story reveals and gives us confidence to believe in Jesus in spite of our fears is that, number two, Jesus is the ruler of the universe. Look with me at John 6, 19b through 20. They were terrified, but he called out to them, Don't be afraid. I am here. As I said earlier, it's interesting to note that Jesus calls out to the terrified disciples first. His words are very important to note. First, Jesus speaks a word of assuring peace to them. His presence with them in the storm brought with it peace, but whenever I read this Bible story, it makes me think of another story. Horatio Spafford was a Chicago businessman and he, who had, well, he had it all. Huge amounts of wealth, beautiful wife, five children, and most importantly, a deep and abiding faith in Jesus. 
And kind of like Job in the Old Testament of the Bible, tragedy came to his happy life. First, his four-year-old son Horatio Jr. died suddenly of scarlet fever. Then only a year later, a massive fire swept through downtown Chicago, devastating the city, including many of the properties owned by Horatio. And that day, almost 300 people lost their lives, and around uh, 100,000 were made homeless. And despite the, his own uh, substantial financial loss, uh, the Spafford sought to demonstrate their love of Christ by assisting those who were grief-stricken and were in great need. It was two years later, uh, Spafford decided that his family should maybe take a vacation from all this and, and head over to England. So Horatio was delayed because of his business, but he sent his wife and the four remaining children ahead, and while crossing the Atlantic on a steamship, their vessel struck another, and 226 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's daughters. Remarkably, Anna Spafford, his wife, survived the tragedy, and upon rescue, Anna immediately sent a telegram to her husband, which included the words, saved alone. Receiving Anna's message, he set off once, at once to be reunited with his wife. And one particular day during the voyage, the captain summoned him to the bridge of the vessel. And pointing to his charts, he explained that they were passing over the very spot where the ship had sank and where his daughters had died. And Spafford returned to his cabin and wrote these words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. The wellness of his soul is because of the presence of Jesus with him in his storm. Jesus was with him in his life. Is he with you and yours? But there's more important Jesus statement here than I don't be afraid, I am here. The phrase, I am here would have stirred in the hearts of these 12 Jewish boys because of a story that they had heard earlier in history. Moses, the great emancipator of God's people from slavery in Egypt, told the story of when he had a first encounter with God at the burning bush. And after taking off his, his sandals because he was on holy ground, Moses asked God what God's name was. Read with me. God's response to Moses in Exodus 3.14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God's name is I am. I am who I am. And when Jesus said, I am here, he was saying in essence that I am the God who was with Moses and who rescued them. And I am the God who will rescue you now. I am with you in the storm, my children. So the real question is, do we see Jesus in the waves of the storms of our lives? Do we welcome his peace like a river on our, our, the, the ravishing waves? Do, is it well? Or is it diseased with our souls? When we go through the difficulties of life, He is, after all, the ruler of the universe. This week I read a story about a pastor who went through a painful loss. Well-intentioned friends told him that uh, someday he would know why he and his wife suffered so much. And I love what he wrote. He said, the scriptures do not promise to the disciples that they will know the answer for every struggle or trial or storm that comes their way. What it does say, though, is that God is good and he will not leave us. 
In the end, we do not need to know why God allows great suffering. What we needed to know was that we could trust him. What we needed was Christ to come and say, my child, I am. Do not be afraid. Often in a, in a storm, we look for answers. Why? And we cry out, yet Jesus comes to us in the storms of life and says, do not be afraid, I am. And that's the presence of Jesus, the great I am, that brings to us what Paul called the peace that passes all understanding. So Jesus was not only telling them, hey, it's your rabbi, your friend Jesus. He was saying, God is with you, the ruler of the universe. And that's what we really need to hear when we are in the storms of our lives. We need to know that we're not alone. When my, my dad died, I was 18 years old. And he had been sick for three years, but he was tough. And I was sure he was going to beat this. So when my sister called me early that June morning and told me that he was gone, it was unexpected. I'd been to see him the night before at the hospital, but I had only stayed about five minutes. I had some plans with friends, and so it was more of a check-in than a visit. So when I received that phone call, I was kind of in a fog. And I remember people, one by one, speaking to me and saying kind words, but none of it really helped. That was until my friend John came to me and said, there's nothing I can say, but I'm here. Now, I don't remember anything else anybody said to me during that time, but I remember what he said because I needed somebody with me when the storms hit. And the good news is we have someone. I am is with us. Let's get back to the Bible story. The next day after the stormy boat trip, the crowd has been uh, miraculously fed and found Jesus on the other side of the lake and asked him to be, to, to, to uh, asked him how he got there. Because the last time they saw Jesus was seven or eight miles away on the other side of the lake. And Jesus kind of well, he kind of reads their mail. He knows what's going on. And he knows what they're really interested in is maybe some more bread, some more food for their belly. So look at what Jesus says next in John six twenty nine. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Once again, Jesus invites people to believe in him. The Stranger Things miracle of the seven signs of John's biography or Jesus are about pointing out our deepest trust in Jesus. And you see, I've, I've read the end of the book. The same John, decades later, would write what he saw in the Spirit. Look at his promise in Revelations 20, 10 and, and verse 14a. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus, our victor, once and for all, defeats evil in all its insidious forms, and in this day, God says, we will wipe away every tear from our eyes and there will be no more death and no more sorrow and no more crying or no more pain. All these things will be gone forever. Jesus is the great I am. And he will reign forever and ever with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And on that day, sin will be defeated once and for all. And on that day, 
There will be one ruler of the universe, Jesus, the victor over evil and the ruler of the universe. Believe in him. The band is back up. We're going to do one final song. And as we always do on the first Sunday of the month, we're going to celebrate uh, Holy Communion together. And uh, we invite you to partake in this. You don't have to be a member here. You don't have to uh, be Methodist. All you have to be is someone who wants to, be a, to have a closer relationship with Jesus and wants to have your sins forgiven and wants eternal life. Because on that night, that night when his, his very friends gathered together, one who would betray him and another 11 who would run away. And he knew this, but still he wanted to have supper with them. He knew they weren't perfect. He knew there were things about them that weren't perfect, kind of like us. He knows we're not perfect, but he still invites us to the table. So on that night, he, he took some bread. He gave thanks to God. And he broke the piece of bread into pieces. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat this and remember me. After supper, he took the cup. And once again, he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and drink this. this. This is my blood that's going to be poured out for all of you and for many more for forgiveness of sins and eternal life. So as the band plays our final song, I invite you to come forward, to stand and come forward as the Holy Spirit leads. Uh, take a piece of bread, dip it in the cup, take it to yourself. We use juice here because we know that there's some that struggle with something stronger. But come as you feel the Spirit lead.